So this was our first parking garage that we you know, have yet come out of the ground. Lighting is a key load in parking garages because for exactly the reason when you just came in here, the cave effect that you get when you're um, coming in out of the dark, you don't want a car coming in out of the, uh, the bright sunlight and then finding a pedestrian the hard way as they hit that cave effect. So we have lighting. There's some things um, as these, basically as we get additional sunlight along the west side and the east side, there's daylight sensors that actually turn them on, uh, on and off. So it's sensing, do I have enough light level in this part of the building and turning lights on and off. There's also a couple different kinds of lighting in here, the induction fluorescence. Um, if you haven't seen those yet, the city's gone to those in their parking garage as well. Very long life, 100,000 hour lamps, great efficiency. We now use them in Moby Gym as well. If you're a basketball or volleyball fan, you've seen those. Um, but you'll still see some metal halides mixed in that has to do with the entryway cave effect thing is that to get enough lumens right inside the door, they added a few extra metal halides. A couple other things for you guys that haven't used it before, that fiberglass addition that they do in concrete is supposed to help the surface not be so slippery and also help keep your um, concrete from cracking. You get, don't get as much cracking at the surface. So that was one of the things that we did um, to try to help basically make that longer life and then you get the issues of you know cars bringing in water off the street and then you're in the shadows and in the winter time that can create icing so let's walk this way nice indoor parking for bicyclists so you can get them in out of the weather in a safe secure there's security cameras over there this is actually the largest system on campus that csu owns outright many of you know about our five megawatt 5.3 megawatt system on foothills campus but that's a third party ownership deal. We buy the power from them, but we don't own that system. We don't have actually own the environmental attributes to that plant. This plant is one that's owned and operated. It's all ours. 132 point something kilowatts. I can't remember the exact fraction, but uh, you can see how the panels, well, you can see the shading as to why the panels are not filling up the entire roof it's because the street lights and other things cause shadowing and so they basically squeezed in as many collectors as they could on the roof area that we had we built this parking garage at a time where the construction industry was pretty depressed and we got a great bid on it and so one of our ad alternates was solar power and basically the way we bid it was we have x number of dollars how many kilowatts of power can you put on my roof for that the other part that we built in it's kind of the buzzwords kind of renewable ready is that structurally this parking garage is designed to cover the whole roof like that. So if we get additional funding or if the city comes through with, you know, they've been talking about feed-in tariffs and other things, if there's some incentives from the city, it may make sense for us to come back and revisit this and put additional solar on this roof. I think it's been calculated. We can get somewhere in the order of four or 500 kW on this roof. Like I said, we've got 132 now. Just looking at it, yeah, it looks like we could easily go to 500 with additional um, structures like that. A couple things about this. It's cool in that it doesn't take up any additional real estate. You know, it's in a place that's not wasting any space. The reality is this is my most expensive installation, okay? If you look at it, all the steel that we had to do to span these big um, aisleways, because you can't put posts down in the middle of your driveways, they frown on that, you know? Um, so structurally, it's just a more expensive installation. From a real estate, from a space saving standpoint, there's a lot of reasons that it's a great installation. Be aware that it's costly to put them on a roof on a parking garage. The payback, you know, what's power gonna do for the next 20 years? Probably in the order of somewhere between 10 and 15 years is in that order of magnitude, okay? We don't, it's really hard, particularly on this one, which costs are associated with this, you know, in terms of, you know, additional structural issues on the parking garage, and part of that was, I hope none of you are structural engineers. The structural engineer was really not very familiar with working with solar, and his first reaction was, that's like adding a whole nother deck to the parking garage, and I'm like, what? Those things do not weigh what cars weigh, you know? And it does, if you understand structural engineering, it does point load the weight that lands on that roof, okay? Because it, you know, ends up at those single points, but they ended up over-engineering the garage pretty substantially so that we had the potential to put solar on the roof. So there's sort of a wide range of values that we actually attribute to the solar panels right there. We have six systems on campus. If you picked up one of those brochures during our talk, the big one 
is third party owned, so they could take advantage of the tax credits and the accelerated depreciation, and that really brings the cost down. Most of these that we've got on campus, from this one at 132 kilowatts down to the 12.6 or whatever is on the academic village, are all, there was a little pot of money left in the construction budget, what can we do to, uh, to A, get another lead point, we guys all know about that, and B, to start making a dent in, in offsetting the usage of our buildings. Like I said, this one, this structure is one third solar powered and we own all the environmental attributes to that, to that power, so we get to take credit for that. And for those of you in design, you know, it's always the devils in the details. Why in a perfectly daylit stairwell do we have lights on? Because some electrical engineer says it's a stairwell and the lights have to be on 24 seven. And so, yes. So there's still work to be done, but yes. There's big money to be had in who gets to put Coke or Pepsi machines on campus. And we went from a Pepsi campus to a Coke campus this summer and will be a Coke campus for the next 10 years. But we got new Energy Star machines. So if you're negotiating with your drink supply vendor, ask for an Energy Star machine. They perform significantly better. We've done some energy monitoring. We used to have on the old machines these devices that when they weren't people around, they would turn the lights off and turn the compressors off for part of the time. And these machines didn't have that technology, but they operated inherently more efficiently. But then we got to talking to them about it. It's like, why do we need the lights at all? So they pulled all the lights on campus because everybody knows where the Coke machines are. It's not, like, it's not like an outdoor mall where you have a bunch of strangers walking by that need to figure out where the Coke machine is. You know, in our residence halls and other places, they're in little alcoves anyway. So we've pulled all the lights. It saves us a kilowatt hour a day per machine. Add it up. I did the math. It's, we've got something like 175 machines on campus times 365 days a year. I think I figured out it's enough to run five whole households in Fort Collins for a year. So just pulling the lights in a Coke machine. Okay, you know, so every little bit helps. For those of you that are bicycles, we try to work on having high-speed bikeways through town. So if you take the pedestrian side and leave this for the bicyclist, just want to talk a little bit about stormwater while we're on this plaza. This little hour-shaped glass piece of concrete right behind me here with a couple of catch basins in the middle. When we originally did this plaza, it was just badly poured. There's no other way to do it talk about it. And so we kept getting puddling in the middle of it. And you go, in the wintertime, that means it's an ice skating rink. And it was just a... It was just an eyesore in the middle of our pretty plaza. So at some point, somebody decided we're gonna do permeable paving there. It's like, cool, let's do that. So we ripped it out, put in the permeable paving. And the long and short of it is I haven't gotten the mechanism of failure. It failed in less than a year. I don't know if it wouldn't drain, if it would, whatever. We did not perform as our landscape architects had hoped. They yanked out the permeable paving and we're now back to regular paving with mostly a good slope. There's actually still one little puddle that forms at this end, drives us crazy. You know, little stuff like that drives you nuts. All right, so I'm gonna to try to talk more quietly in here because there are classes going on in this building. So one of the big features of this building is the daylighting. And obviously, you know, with atriums, there's atriums in a couple of different places so that almost every office in this building has access to daylight. These offices here are in interior of the building, but they have daylight through this through this window, through this nice um, atrium space. Um, the lights in here are daylight controlled. In the middle of the day, they actually do go off. Um, it's interesting, we've talked about making it controlled because I think a lot of the students would end up turning it off because it seems pretty lit in here to me. At the very top, those are solar tubes. Yeah, to actually help the cave effect. Okay, you know, the, sort of if you have the bright, just to help lighten up that ceiling um, to make that, and also to provide a little more daylighting into the space. One of the things we've done in here that we have never done in, is um, real plants, not, not plastic. This is our stormwater detention area for the building. Also, we did more of the native and adaptive landscape. We've frankly struggled a little bit with the grass because the standard on campus is the Kentucky bluegrass that looks nice and green and lush. And the mix here is more, again, native and adaptive species. And it's starting to fill in, starting to look better, but we're really struggling it with it in contrast to the Kentucky bluegrass on campus. I think if, I think like on our Foothills campus, we don't have bluegrass anywhere. And sort of, it's all sort of natural vegetation and it's not quite as stark looking, but we get comments about, negative comments about how this looks sometimes. And I think maybe we just need to let the, give it a little more time. So we'll see. Well, if you look at the table and look at the walls, they did this thing where they did a face 
there's Maya Angelou, there's Michael Jordan, there's Bill Gates, and the, and the face continues onto the table. And I always joke, it's like, what if they shuffled the tables around and we had, you know, Maya Angelou's chin on Michael Jordan's face, you know, but uh, one of the things the students ask for in their spaces is uh, study niches. They want collaborative space, I think is the buzzword. So you'll see this all around these new buildings. Wide spots in hallways, little rooms. Those study rooms we took our head in, those are booked all day long. So the students are asking for that. And again, comfy places for them to just hang out. And I don't know if you saw those guys pushing those carts as we walked by that big classroom. They actually check out laptops there. So you can check out a laptop and work for a couple hours. That's a service through the library. Those are actually spun aluminum. Again, art in public places. We get those in public buildings. And I was like, I hope those cables are really strong. I have this vision of them coming out and impaling somebody. Now this is one of the things in new buildings that's sort of a pet peeve of mine. They're all over. Big screen TVs are replacing bulletin boards. And it's great for dynamic information. You can post stuff quickly. You can keep them in interesting and all that. How much money does it take to keep operating this? you know, 24-7, 365. Now, we're doing a behavioral campaign in one of the buildings on campus that does close down at night. Some of these buildings are nearly 24-7, so there's not really an unoccupied time. But in the Tilt building, I showed you the picture of the Great Room. They've got some of these in their building. And one of their green team suggestions was, can we put them on timers and turn them off at night, you know? So that's one of the things we're looking at. I think the students sort of expect it now, you know, that's kind of, you know, old-fashioned bulletin boards I don't think really connect with the modern student, and this does, but that's also one more energy thing. Five of these, it's no big deal. When I start having 50 of these, and we might start thinking about, you know, it's just one more way that electrical use is creeping into my building when I'm trying to make it creep out, you know, so yeah. Again, with the uh, landscaping out here, the native and adaptive species, so that the low water use, Obviously, as the trees develop and create a little more shade on this plaza, this will be a really nice place. And actually, in the middle of winter, when it's you know one of those days where it's a little too cool to sit outside, unless you're in the full sun, this will be a great place to be. But I, even in the summer, I think as these trees grow up and provide a little shade. We've got some nice spaces over here. They did this as part of this project, even though the education building didn't get remodeled. They put this fountain water feature over there. And frankly, from an energy perspective, water features drive me nuts because they're high maintenance, high energy use. But the reality is the students love it. You never, you never walk by that fountain and there's not students. In between classes, it's packed. Um, it's just a nice place. The problem with water features in Colorado on a college campus, there's only about two or three months of the year where the students actually get to see it with water in it because we've got to freeze protect it here pretty quickly. Microbiology Study Lounge was a small addition. What year did we build this? 2007. 2007, so several years ago. And this was in the built to lead standards phase of construction that we talked about during the presentation. So the building itself is not LEED certified, but when we built it, we wanted to dabble in green roofs because we've been getting a lot of pressure to, you know, do some green roofs. The building, the bids came in, frankly, we couldn't afford the green roof. But that whole renewable ready thing that we talked about on the parking garage, we built it structurally so we could add a green roof later. And then it turns out about a year or so later, a woman in the horticulture department comes to facilities and says, I got some research money to study which plants will do best, best on green roofs. You got a spot for me? And we're like, huh, yeah, we do. And so this started as a research project. And she was using, for those of you who didn't know, the, the sort of the tray systems where you can take plants in and out because she was doing research trying to figure out what worked and what didn't. We've since gone to the more permanent structure. The thing that drives me nuts about green roofs is we finally had to resort to installing irrigation, which is kind of counterintuitive to what we're trying to accomplish with a green roof, but we can't make them live in Colorado without irrigation. This particular setting is a particularly challenging one because look at our orientation. It's got a west aspect to it. So it, the only sun it gets is from noon on and that's going to be hot, drier sun. So it's a particularly challenging application, but Otherwise, you know, it's doing what green roofs do, which it, when it does rain, it filters rainwater, delays the runoff, all that good stuff. But the fact that we have to irrigate it drives me crazy. <laughs> because for those of us in the business of doing good roofs, putting water on your roof on purpose is kind of counterintuitive. I don't know if you had anything you wanted to add to Becca's, um, my yeah. intern. So. <laughs> it's six inches of uh, peat, actually. 
if you're familiar with peat, it doesn't go through an aquifer system or anything like that. So we're, we are limited in the plants that we can use. Um, there's not a lot of water retention capability in six inches. So like Carol was saying earlier, we've definitely gone with uh, sedums and, and uh, drought resistant plants. We have done uh, herbs and spices one season we did an herb and, herbs and spices and actually harvested the herbs and spices and by bicycle transported them down to the student center where we have uh, the Aspen Grill which is our local um, local restaurant that features local meats and produce and breads and so we put it to good use and um, it was popular and the, the, the herbs were but it didn't really work out as well and we also have herbs growing in our greenhouse so it didn't make sense to keep going with that um, so we've tried a variety of different uh, it's it's definitely a trial and error it's it's only been working in, in, in harvest for four years so which four years is kind of a long time but not really when you're you know trial and error so there's still a bunch of things that need to get figured out um, and it, it, Green roofs are very popular in high precipitation areas, Chicago, Canada, Minnesota, uh, and we don't really get that much during the summer and spring. You know, it's interesting, I know they were doing a study on the EPA roof, is that they have solar panels and a green roof, and it turns out the plants do much better under the solar panels because they get a little bit of shade. And so that might be an interesting hybrid is to do solar panels and green roof and, and get more success out of both. Everybody's always got their pet peeve about what's not right about campus, but the reality is I look at the buildings that we've built in the last couple of years compared to the buildings we built 10 years ago, the Yates Hall building over here, and there's a quantum leap in energy performance, comfort, aesthetics, lots of things between the Yates Hall building and that building. And so we've come up the learning curve really incredibly and we're starting to do things I think doing things a lot better on campus, but we're really proud of the fact we um, just last just last week um, were listed. Uh, the Association for the Advancement of Sustainability in Higher Education did a, a solar database, and they just released that. And we're in the top four of large research institutions. So a couple schools in Arizona, and our dear friends down the road at Air Force just put in a six megawatt system. So uh, they got us beat, but. The reality is it's great that universities across the country are stepping up and starting to do this because we're an example and you look at all the young people around is that, you know, I want these students to come out of here and start asking their bosses, so why aren't we putting solar in our building? Why aren't we getting daylight in our buildings? And starting to raise the bar in terms of, you know, the next generation of, you know, not that I want to warp young minds, but I do, you know, <laughs> in a good way. <laughs>